Thank you for coming today evening, today afternoon, and I'm grateful to be here with all of you. So I'll speak on the topic as was mentioned, transform your mind, transform your world. The first experience I had in my life of the power of the mind was when I was about 10. At that time, I was into astronomy. I was in, living in India, and I had my own telescope, go up to the sky, terrace, and look at the sky for hours. So at one time, we were going to have a major eclipse. And I was waiting in the night to see that. For days and weeks, I had been planning about it. In fact, I got a new my telescope just for that purpose. And just before that, I had a quarrel with someone. And then, the thoughts were just going on in my mind about that. And then the eclipse came, and I was with my eyes to the telescope. But the eclipse came, and eclipse went. And then my friend who was watching next to me said, wasn't that beautiful? What? Eclipse you didn't see? It struck me at that time that the sky out there is so interesting for me. For days and months and years I've been reading about it. And yet there is something inside me that can catch my attention so powerfully that I neglect what is out there. So I started thinking, trying to understand what is actually in here. What is in here that can captivate our attention so forcefully? Normally we get distracted when the externals are not very interesting. Say if a talk is going on and the talk is boring, then we, our mind may wander everywhere. But the mind is such a thing, even when the externals are interesting, still the mind can pull us. So the, the word, the mind, is something which we use very commonly. However, if we look at it from a more analytical perspective, a modern philosopher of the mind, he said that, I refuse to study the mind, because he says the mind has no locus standi. There is no place in the body where we can locate the mind. We can locate the brain, but the brain is a physical organ. The mind is something different from the brain. Now we may or may not be able to locate the brain, locate the mind, but the mind always seems to locate us. That means it finds where we are, it finds where our attention is vulnerable and it distracts us. And not only can the mind distract us from something interesting, but it can actually distort our perception of reality. Now the biggest health problems in today's world is mental health problems. And if we consider depression, anxiety, these are problems which occur when, for those people, their world may be having some problems those who are depressed, those who are worried. But the mind is what increases the problems. So Martin Luther King had put his finger on this long ago. So I'll talk about this topic in four broad categories, four themes, education, experimentation, evaluation, and elevation. So right now I'm talking about education. Education means we try to understand what the mind is. So Martin Luther King put his finger on this problem when he said our scientific power has outrun our spiritual power. We have guided missiles and misguided men. Now, if we look at the history of science around the 16th, 17th century, when science started taking off, at that time, scientists divided the world into what they called as the primary characteristics and the secondary characteristics. And they defined the primary characteristics to be those which we can measure, which, can, which are mathematical. Length, breadth, mass, density, velocity. 
and everything else was considered subjective and it was relegated to the level of secondary properties. If we consider our own experience, when we experience the world, we don't experience the world first and foremost in terms of mathematical dimensions. We experience it in terms of sensations, in terms of emotions. So from our experience, the primary experience is not mathematical qualities. A simple example is, say, if you went for a program where there was a grand feast after the program. And then after that feast, you enjoyed the feast, went to your home, and then you were telling a family member, a friend, oh, this feast was so wonderful. This dessert was excellent. And then they ask, okay, tell me more about the desert. Now, would we go into a list of telling all the ingredients that were in the desert? We would tell how tasty it was. Now, taste is an experience. And when we look at food, yes, we are conscious of our weight and our health. So, we will look at the ingredients, no doubt. But our primary experience of food is in terms of the taste. And with all our scientific advancement, it is very difficult to come up. We may have a thermometer, a barometer. We can't have a tasteometer. This is a primary experience, but this is not mathematical. Similarly, if we consider one of the greatest causes of anxiety in today's world, uh, sociologists have been studying the phenomena of fear over centuries. And if you look at the top 10 fears of the 18th century, the 19th century, 20th century, and 21st century, there are two fears which have been added to the list of the top 10. One is the fear of terrorists, and the other is the fear of rejection. When we form a relationship and that other person just uses us and rejects us, it is a great fear. Now, when we are, want to form a relationship with someone, we want to know, does this person really care for me? If, with all our, again, if we could, with our technological advancement, make something like a loveometer, just put it in the heart of whoever we want to form a relationship with. And look at the reading. Oh, you really care. You don't care for me. <laughs> you know, we can't do that. Now, love is a very real experience for us. At the same time, the it is not something which can which can be measured. And the point here is not to minimize uh, science and technology and the progress it has done. The point is to contextualize it. That there is. Uh, area of study within us which requires some things which the scientific worldview systematically leaves out. Now, this is not a fault because if we are using our eyes, if we are using our eyes with our eyes, no matter how many binoculars or telescopes we put on, we can't hear sound with the eyes. So, there are so the mind falls in this category where the mind if we consider the seat of emotions of desires of of the subtle phenomena the mind is something which we cannot even place within the worldview that is constructed from empiricism upwards the mind is real and it has real effects on us so, how do we understand what the mind is? So, I would like to offer a model from the ancient yoga texts of India, which help us to make sense of what the mind is and how it functions. So, th the Bhagavad Gita is an ancient yoga text and it explains that the self can be conceived to be a three level entity. There's the body, the mind, and the soul, as you're saying. Uh, the soul, the mind, we could call as our lower self. I'll explain what that I mean by that. The soul is the higher self. So, a rough analog of this would be the body is like the hardware, 
the mind is the software and the soul the source of the consciousness is the user with our technology we have succeeded in advancing the hardware of the body we have succeeded in improving the physical reality enormously but the mental level of reality that has not proportionately been improved and thus we have the paradox of people being more and more physically comfortable and yet being more and more mentally distressed unhappy miserable so we have we could say many people who are today comfortably unhappy <laughs> yeah at a physical level we are comfortable but the mind is going wild and it is making us unhappy just as if a device has brand new hardware but if if software is damaged then it will not function similarly if our mind gets agitated distracted contaminated then no matter how physically fit we may be how physically comfortable we may be we will not be happy or to speak of happy we will not even have basic functional capacity now this is a model we could say this is hypothetical is there some way we could get some inkling of this some glimpse of it or some intuitive experience of this i like to do a simple thought experiment to this is the second part i'll go to i talked about education now experimentation so those of you are having lunch you can continue those of you are not you could join the experiment or those of you are having lunch also you could if you would like you can pause for a few minutes so wherever you are you can sit comfortably and you can close your eyes and after closing your eyes now you can take 3 deep breaths 1 2 3 as the breath comes in and goes out you can feel the tension in your body leaving so you can clench both your fists as tightly as possible you can feel your whole body becoming tense and now unclench and you breathe out as you tense and relax your muscles you'll feel the tension in your body decreasing now once again think of your right fist clench it again as you clench it try to visualize that fist on your mind's eye and once again tighten your fist keep visualizing it on your mind's eye and now release the fist and let out a breath as you see this fist on your hand on your mind's eye you have opened your hands you have relaxed your hands and you can feel a sense of relaxation going through your entire body now do the same thing for your left fist clench it tightly and visualize it on your mind's eye take a deep breath and as you release the breath unclench your fist you feel your whole body relaxing and you can see in your mind's eye your hands unclenched and your hands also relaxing when you observe your hand notice that it is your hand 
which you can feel by your side. At the same time, it's an image of your hand which you can see on something like an inner screen next to you, in front of you. And then there is you who are noticing the hand next to you, who are noticing the image of the hand on that inner screen and you are the observer of all this. You can take one more deep breath and you can open your eyes. Thank you. Now when you do this simple relaxation exercise, what we did right now was, at one level we relax the body. But at another level, this visualization, if we analyze the visualization that we did, there was the hand and we were experiencing, okay, my hand is by my side. And we were visualizing the hand on some kind of a screen inside you. And we were seeing that also. So that inner screen on which we were seeing the outer reality, that inner screen is our mind. So this is the outer scene where we exist, where you say you are looking at me, I am looking at you, you are looking at the slideshow. This is the physical level of reality. The physical level of reality is projected on the inner screen, on the mind. The mind is like the inner screen. And then you are the inner seer. During normal functioning, this inner screen acts like a window. And if a window is transparent, if it is so spotlessly clean that sometimes we may not even notice there is a window. If the glass is completely clean, we may not even notice that there is something in between. There might be a person there, person here, and we think I'll just walk there and then we bump into this screen. So th during normal functioning, this inner screen is like a transparent window whose presence we may not even notice. However, when we closed our eyes and did this visualization, at that time, because the eyes were closed, we were not seeing the physical reality. But a picture of that was coming on the inner screen. So the seer is here, the screen is here, and the scene is here. When the mind malfunctions, like earlier I talked about a software hardware user, when the software gets corrupted, at that time, the screen which is there inside us, instead of acting as a window, it starts acting like a TV screen. And it starts projecting something entirely different. So this is what brings us to the third point, that is evaluation. Last year I had come here to California and I visited a friend. He had a house which is overseeing the mountain and the greenery on that side. So we were sitting and chatting and we were looking at the large window and the scenery outside. And suddenly I noticed this is a giant gorilla charging through the wilderness straight towards the window. Maybe the kind of gorilla you may see in the planet of the apes. No, ah, that gorilla was charging, raising a, its fist, about to smash into the window. I became a little concerned. I looked at my friend and he was grinning. I looked at him once again and noticed that he had something in his hands. I looked carefully. It seemed some, like something like a remote. And he pressed it and the gorilla disappeared. What is that? So he told me that the window which he had in that house, he had designed it such a way that the window could double as a TV screen where he wanted. And just for further entertainment, he had made a customized video clip 
using animation with the same background that was seen through the window and a gorilla projected on it. <laughs> so, for somebody who doesn't know whether it's actually functioning as a window or as a TV screen, the sight of a gorilla, gorilla may scare that person. So, it's, one has to carefully observe to understand what is this win window, the screen functioning as. Similarly, our mind is like a dual function screen. It can function as a window, it can function as a TV. So going back to the starting example I gave, when I was looking at the sky eagerly waiting for the eclipse, so I was expecting my mind to function like a window. But because of that quarrel I had with someone, my mind went off on an angry revenge fantasy. Why did you do this? I will do this. And that TV was, that was my mind was showing me, it consumed me so much that I was not even aware of what was happening out there. So this inner screen, how it is functioning, we all need to evaluate that. That is where evaluation comes in. Now this might seem a little abstract, but let me give a few more examples to illustrate this. If we consider that this inner screen, which can function as a TV, it can go in many, the TV can depict many things. But suppose that TV starts going into the past and starts displaying a, a tragedy movie of all the bad things that have happened to us in the past. Oh, this person did like this to me, that went wrong over there, I made a mess of things over here. When this inner screen starts displaying this tragedy movie of which we are not the spectator, but we are the victim in that. That is when we get depression. Depression occurs when the mind starts replaying all the bad things that have happened to us and we start thinking that the future is going to be more of the same. Of course, sometimes depression can be a clinical condition which requires medical treatment. But more often than not, even that clinical depression begins with the minds replaying this old sad story. Conversely, when this inner screen starts going into the future and starts playing out all the worst case scenarios that might emerge. This may go wrong, that may go wrong, that may go wrong. And the mind starts showing a horror movie over there. And that's when we get worried. We get overwhelmed by anxiety, tension. Worry is like the interest that we pay on loans we haven't yet taken. <laughs> Most often if you look at the things that we are worried about, they not, they not happen. And many of them may never happen also. Now, this is not to say that we shouldn't learn from the past or prepare for the future. We can control this inner screen and direct it backwards, where we are aware, I am, I, am, I am in the present and I am thinking about the past. If we are aware of what we are doing with the inner screen, then we can direct it the way we want. Okay, this thing happened, at that time I spoke this, maybe I could have spoken this. At this point, when they did like this, I should have done like this, but I did like this. When we are in control, when we direct the things, the inner screen backwards, then we can learn from the past. But otherwise, we end up simply lamenting the past. And similarly, we need to plan and prepare for the future. But again, it's when we are aware, okay, I am consciously taking my thoughts to the future and then I analyze, okay, this happens, what can I do? This happens, what can I do? This happens, what can I do? But when Without our conscious awareness, the mind just wanders off into the past to the future. That is when it aggravates our problems. So life determines our problems, but we determine their size. What do I mean by this? That 
what happens at the physical level of reality that life will determine but how much i dwell on it that is something which i determine and this brings us to uh, the th further point of evaluation mm -hmm. not every thought deserves our thought we use the word thought in two distinct senses i got a thought and i have given this a lot of thought when i say i got a thought what we are meaning at that time is in terms of this model of the inner screen some stimulus popped up on the inner screen whereas i have given this a lot of thought means i have analyzed this systematically and then i have come to certain conclusions if we consider this screen inner screen on which the outer reality appears as this is not just a window or a tv even when it is a window it often directs our vision in particular directions that is where our impressions come into the picture every single action that we do it forms impressions within us and those impressions come as the propositions within us say if we come into a house for the first time some of us may notice oh this house the interior design of this house is very good some of us may notice okay who is there in this house right now some of us may notice if we are very hungry is there any food here someone who might be an alcoholic can i drink something there yeah, is something so it's the same perception with same situation what we zero in on that will vary we're going back to the software example say so suppose somebody has uh, visited a particular website repeatedly say in india there is a huge movie industry it's called bollywood so suppose somebody has visited bollywood.com repeatedly and then say they come for a spiritual talk and they hear about the bhagavad gita it seems a little interesting so then they decide to go and go to their computer and google it up and they for typing bhagavad gita they type b and as soon as they type b what happens what do you think happens bollywood.com Bollywood comes up now or uh, you could take a more common example say somebody visits sports.com and then they want to visit they learn something about spirituality i want to visit spirituality.com but as soon as you type s p so what happens sports.com will come up so here i this particular point not every thought deserves our thought what this means is why that bollywood or sports coming on my browser because that's what i have selected in the past that's what i have visited in the past so our action every action forms a impression within us and that impression comes as a proposition so each action that we do it's like a choice we have made as a surfer we that takes a choice on our browser that gets saved and that is a preference you said that is a impression and that will come as a proposition so many of the thoughts that come up within us they are just propositions from our past so if somehow we lived around people who were pessimistic people who were very worried or people who were depressed or somehow for whatever reason if we have got a habit of being depressed of being worried of being hypercritical then those propositions will automatically come up within us and it is for us to evaluate does this thought deserve my attention so not every thought by the word thought means uh, i got a thought that's a proposed as uh, a stimulus appearing on the inner screen not every thought deserves our thought here the thought means do i give it my attention and this brings us to another point that our thoughts do not have any power till we give them our thought and a thought comes in just like something pops up on our computer unless we click on it it's not going to open up the pop up will stay there 
and if you don't do anything about it, pop up will disappear after some time. So many times when negative thoughts come up within us, fear, anger, insecurity, resentment, they they pop up. And it is when we give attention to them, that is when they grow. And if we decide not to give attention to them, we can prevent them from growing. Let me give a couple of examples for this. Let's consider that the, a common feeling that we experience when things don't go our way. They plan something and things happen the opposite. We may feel resentment. Say we had planned to go for a outing with some friends and just the night before the outing we, fall, we get flu and we are on our bed and we have friends who have gone out and from some hill station somewhere they're sending photos to us and we see the photos and we are feeling so angry you know, why did this have to happen to me now here if you observe carefully the reality that the, there is the outer scene there is the inner screen and there is the seer. If you consider the reality, when if you have flu, it is not particularly painful. We just get a little tired, we feel uneasy, we might need to rest more. So the reality doesn't hurt so much. But the resentment of reality hurts more than the reality. So in terms of this model, what is happening? What does the resentment actually mean? It means that instead of focusing on my physical scene where I am in, the inner screen is showing what might have been. And why was it not like this? And if we keep giving our attention to that inner screen instead of the outer scene, we will make ourselves miserable. So in a sense, we could say this, this is a linear reality, the seer, screen and scene. But there is a choice. Sometimes the screen is showing one thing, and the scene is showing something else. So when we say live in the present, what it essentially means is don't carry, get carried away with whatever is appearing on the screen. Come back to the scene. So for us, evaluation means we evaluate whether a thought deserves our attention. So if we don't think about the friends who are having a, a great time out there and we start doing something constructive we may read some book we watch something constructive we do some breathing exercises we meditate we find that life is not that bad things are okay so evaluation ensures that we do not put our thought energy where it is unproductive or counterproductive and how we can we evaluate if we understand that I am not my thoughts, I am not my mind, which is the generator of these thoughts. We are the observer of our thoughts. So one of the messages of the Bhagavad Gita is, don't identify with the mind, identify the mind. Don't identify with the mind. That means when an emotion comes up, don't get carried away with it. Identify the mind. Okay. This is, now I am... Now I am going on a track which will take me to anger, which will take me to depression, which will take me to negativity. If we consider a snowball, at the top of the mount, top of the hill, it is not a snowball, it is a snow pebble. And a snow pebble, you know, we could just hit it with our foot, with our toe and it will break apart. But as that snow pebble comes down, 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 it gains mass and it gains momentum. And by the time it has come down, it may knock over a fully grown up person. Similarly, when the stimulus pops up within us, at that time it is like a snow pebble. Now, it is gravity that will push the snow pebble down the hill. But in our case, the thought at the top is like a snow pebble. But it is the attention that we give to it. The more we dwell on it, that is what energizes the thought. And the more it is energized, the further and faster it goes down. And then, at one moment, 
a person might be happy cheerful and one thing happens some thought comes in and th thoughts starts growing and within just a few seconds within a minute that same person might be clenched face gritting teeth brow frowning and heart palpitating completely the mood may change what happened was one some thought came in and we gave attention to it unwittingly so if we could distance ourselves from it then that distancing can help us to recognize okay this thought has popped up i don't have to pay attention to it now how do we do that that is the last part of our talk that is elevation elevation means i talked about the outer scene the inner screen and the inner seer as three levels horizontally but we could envision this as three levels vertically vertically means that there is the physical reality it's like a three level building if you see there is a physical reality there is the mental reality and there is a the spiritual reality so at one level when we talk about mindfulness mindfulness tells us that okay the mind will say many many things just situate yourself in the physical reality just come back to the present focus on the present and that way we don't get carried away by our thoughts so yes that is it is important that our mind doesn't carry us away but there is another way of dealing with the mind we could be we can we could develop mindfulness by staying grounded in physical reality one way to ground ourselves in physical reality could be when we start getting worried when we start getting agitated at that time just start breathing deeply and focus the attention on the breathing so we breathe in breathe out breathe and focus the attention on the breathing then our attention comes back to the physical and that way we are we stop the tv starts showing the inner screen starts showing a tv but we don't get carried away by it but another way is that instead of just coming down to the physical we rise to the spiritual level of reality so meditation is meant ultimately to raise our consciousness to the spiritual level so when we raise our consciousness to the spiritual level at that time we perceive ourselves as a observer separate from the world that is there around us about 12 14 years ago i had advanced tb and i was so weak that a doctor had to give me a lot of blood repeatedly so once late night the doctor was giving me blood and something went wrong and there was a there was the bottle from which blood was supposed to come in but something went wrong and instead of blood coming in blood started going out and the bottle was half full and i was tired i was half asleep and i woke up and i saw i was waiting as the bottle got emptied and i found the bottle instead of getting emptied has become full <laughs> so <laughs> i was alarmed initially and then it is almost as if now i myself don't know whether it was real or conceptual but i felt as if i was seeing myself from above the body and then it struck me okay i'm seeing this pipe here which is going into my skin but under the skin what is there so also there are pipes there are also veins there are arteries and as i was observing myself okay this whole body is a physical structure but i am above this i can observe the body the blood coming in blood going out and as i was observing myself from above so initially when i saw that blood full i was alarmed but then as i felt myself above i was looking down I suddenly felt a sense of calmness yes this physical body is there but i am above this as i observed myself and i felt a calm sensation come within me i just found there was a i remember there was a bell i pressed the bell the nurse came running and i was observing this from above not from below and the nurse came and she saw 
the blood and she became panicky and she screamed. She screamed and then some other nurses came along and then they calmed her down and they fixed the whole issue. And then, so at that time, it was an unusual experience for me. But for all of us, what is an occasional experience can also become a regular experience. When we practice meditation, meditation offers us, you could say a staircase or an elevator to raise our consciousness to the spiritual level. Where we become the observers, not just of our situations, but also of our emotions. And not from the physical level, but from a spiritual level. When we learn to observe ourselves like this, then we can evaluate our thoughts better. And we can choose those thoughts which deserve our attention. Thereby, we can move forwards. One key for being positive in life is gratitude. And sometimes terrible things happen to us. We can't be grateful for all situations. But we can be grateful in all situations. When we say grateful for all situations means our consciousness is caught at the physical level. Why is this happening? Why is this happening? Why is this happening? Say so we are going through our life normally and suddenly we get the news that we are fired. It's a shock. Now, it's a bad thing. But at that time, if we look, if we are caught in that situation, if our consciousness is at the physical level of reality, it's like a giant tsunami wave that comes and sweeps us away. So if our consciousness is caught in what we are seeing out there on the screen, there's a horror movie starts off. But if we understand, that, okay, I am above this. I am a spiritual being. I am an observer of what is happening. And okay, this bad thing has happened. But let me look at what are the good things in my life. You know, I have good health. I have skills. I have capacity to learn. I have experience. I have contacts. I can apply and get some other job. So when I look at what is wrong in my life, then I will feel obsessed, I'll become resentful. But I acknowledge what is wrong in my life, but I shift my attention to what is right in my life. So the inner screen, when it starts showing us what is wrong and replaying, why is this like this, why is this like this? That will make us resentful. But if we move back, okay, I am the observer, and I will choose what appears in this inner screen. I acknowledge that this thing is there, this bad thing has happened, but is it one, two, three, four, five, these things are right in my life. And then, specifically among those right things, we can look at what right thing can help us to deal with that wrong thing. That can bring us even more positivity. And many times, if we just wait and persevere, we might find that even from the bad, something good may emerge. So when we say we can be grateful in all situations, even if we can't be grateful for all situations, what that means is we look for the good instead of the bad, Specifically, we look for the good that helps us to deal with the bad. And then we wait in our inner security for the good that may emerge from the bad. And thus, we can create positivity for ourselves by situating ourselves in elevated consciousness. Another way to look at this is, we may have to live with pain, but we don't have to live in pain. Live with pain means something has gone wrong in our life. And it's true, like somebody has back pain. Now they have to live with that back pain. But if they're constantly thinking of that back pain only, when the back pain is not there, they're thinking, oh, when is the back pain going to come next? If it comes, how bad is it going to be? And oh, why do I have this back pain? Then even if they, they're not living with pain, they're living in pain. So when we elevate our consciousness to the spiritual level, and we understand, okay, this pain is there, it's a part of my life. It is a component of my consciousness. It is not the container of my consciousness. So by elevating our consciousness, we can learn to rise above our emotions, rise above our pain. There are different ways of raising one's consciousness to the spiritual level. We, in our tradition, practice what is called sonic meditation. Sonic meditation means 
you sound as an elevator for raising our consciousness. There are, in this there are various mantras and we chant the mantra which we call as the Hare Krishna mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. There are different traditions which may have different sound vibrations which can assist in raising one's consciousness. The paths can be many. The purpose is one. The purpose is that we want to raise our consciousness to the spiritual level. And what is the, what is the proof that we have actually raised our consciousness to the spiritual level? We'll find that our situations and our emotions won't disturb us that much. So whatever life may get us to, our spirituality will get us through. If we consider a person who is in an ocean, waves will come and the waves will toss the person here and there. But if above that person there is a helicopter and the helicopter sends down a rope, this person catches hold of that rope. Now the waves will still come and hit. But as long as they have held on to that rope, the shaking will become much, much lesser. So our spirituality, the means by which we raise our consciousness upwards is like that rope. The waves of situations and the waves of emotions will hit us. But if we are spiritually centered, then those waves won't shake us that much. We'll recover faster and we'll move forwards in our life. With a spiritual core giving us security, even if we face insecurity and adversity in our life, we will learn to go through it and grow through it. I'll summarize. I spoke today on the topic of transforming our world by transforming our mind. Started by how Martin Luther King said that we have guided missiles and misguided men. Before that I mentioned my experience of the power of the mind. The attractive sky which I was looking for, my attention was caught by some resentment in my mind. So within the scientific worldview, the mind has no locus standi because the scientific worldview focuses on physical measurable parameters. But we experience life in terms of emotions and sensations. So there is no such thing as a tasteometer or a loveometer. But taste and love are, are primary experiences for us. So we look at an alternative model which could help us understand what the mind is. So I talked about the body, mind, soul, the three level model of the self, which is like the hardware, software and user. And to get a sense of this model, I talked about the, the thought, we did the thought experiment of relaxing and uh, clenching our hands, our fist and visualizing it. So the physical reality is like the outer scene, the mind is the inner screen and the self is the inner seer. And when so that I talked about overall four points. First, does anyone remember the four broad points? First was education. Second was experimentation. Did that. Then third was evaluation. Then I talked about how the inner screen, if it moves backwards, that causes us depression. If it moves forward and becomes a TV showing a horror movie, it causes us fear. So this inner screen is dual function. It can be a window or it can be a TV. And that's where we need to evaluate. Not every thought deserves our thought. So when some thoughts appear as default propositions from our past choices, just like our browser may show uh, Bollywood, even if you want to go to Bhagavad Gita, our browser may show sports, even if you want to go to spirituality. So like that, based on our past habits, we may feel depressed, we may feel lonely, we may feel pessimistic, we may feel worried when some things happen in our life. But if we don't give power to our thoughts, they don't have any power. When a thought appears, it's like a snow pebble. It's only when we dwell on it, then it grows till it becomes a snowball and knocks us over. And to evaluate our, to, to better do such an evaluation of our thoughts, it is feasible that we achieve elevation. So when the mind is carrying us here and there, one way to control ourselves is, to focus on physical reality and not get carried away. Another is to rise to spiritual reality. So I talked about this could be three level building and meditation is meant to 
raise our consciousness to the spiritual level where we perceive our emotions and our situations from an inner perspective and respond to them uh, talked about we can if we are situated in the security as an inner seer above our situation and our, and our emotions then we may have to live with pain but we won't have to live in pain even if bad things happen to us even if we can't be grateful for all situations we can be grateful in all situations our spirituality can become like our inner center inner strength like a rope which is a lifeline in an ocean so emotions and situations may hit us but we will be secure internally or whatever life may get us to our spirituality will get us through thank you very much Uh, very insightful. So we're going to take some time for questions. And, uh, and actually what we're doing is we're going to be staying here for 1.30. So if you have questions or would like to have some more depth um, discussion, then feel free to stay. But for the next um, I think four or five minutes, I would like to open up the floor for anybody with some questions. I have a question. Um, I've been recently uh, trying to meditate, and I've been reading a lot of forum about what's the best time to uh, meditate. And I found out that there's a lot of suggestions saying that you know, first thing in the morning, you know, when you wake up, you um, clean up yourself, get ready, and then you know, morning yeah. when you wake up is the best time to meditate. No. Can you explain, uh, can you confirm that's the right time in okay. why is that? Okay, yeah. When is the best time to meditate? Any time is good because we raise our consciousness upward that can give us strength any time. So there is a preferential time that is the morning time. The reason for that is that as the day progresses, we get more and more caught in physical reality. I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to do that. And I, as the, if we see the city also wakes up, the noises start, our consciousness gets dragged more forcefully to the physical level as the day progresses. And that's why to raise the consciousness to the spiritual level during the course of the day will require greater effort. But in the morning, when the, when the pace of the day, the resource pace of the day has not yet started off, if at that time we do it, our mind is not that cluttered. So there are not so many things demanding our attention immediately at the physical level. Then it is easier to rise the consciousness to the spiritual level. So that's why warning is recommended. But it's not essential. Any time that we can do it, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have some questions from the bridge. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have a question on the bridge. So um, there's a comment as well. It's a great technique what you just mentioned. Is it possible for small children to understand this? Maybe the topic that you just uh, Okay. Spoke. Is it possible for small children to understand this? I think the idea of deep breathing is something which anyone can do. And even if they don't exactly analytically understand what is happening, somebody may not understand the exact model. But still, if you can get the consciousness to the physical level itself, instead of the mental level, that itself can calm them down. And if there are different forms of meditation, there is sometimes musical meditation, where certain some mantras are chanted in a musical tune. So if some kids get attracted to that, then that music itself, musical singing may itself calm them down. So we would say that, that in, in spirituality, there, are, there is the philosophy and there are the practices. So we could broadly compare this with science and technology. Now, millions and millions of people use the internet and the cell phones. But very few actually understand how the cell phone and internet works. They just know this works. So for most people, spirituality is access to the practices. They may not understand the philosophy. Understanding the philosophy is like understanding the science behind the technology. For those of us who have the capacity, understanding the science will increase our conviction to use the technology. 
So similarly, if you understand the philosophy, that helps us to access the practices more wholeheartedly. But even if kids don't understand the philosophical analysis of it all, the practices like deep breathing or practices like music or meditation, which is guided by music, that can help them to calm themselves down. So this may be, uh, people are very familiar with meditation, maybe it's not for them, but for, I'm not very familiar. And I kind of want to understand the theory of how meditating or practicing breathing or chanting correlate, like helps you elevate the spiritual level. Like how does it work? Okay, good point. Thank you. So how does, uh, say, breathing or mantra chanting or meditating, how does it actually elevate the consciousness? So as I mentioned, these can act as elevators for the consciousness. So there's a physical reality, the mental reality and the spiritual, these are three levels of reality. And sometimes we may be face facing distressing situations at the physical level. And our mind may aggravate those distressing situations. And that's why if you're at the physical or mental level, you will just get overwhelmed. So we need to rise. Now, if we consider deep breathing, by deep breathing, essentially, the mind that is wandering here, there and everywhere, we try to focus it. So there are two broad ways of meditation. One is by emptying the mind. That means the mind is having this thought, that thought, just focus on the breath. And whichever thought is there, turn it off. Don't focus on it. So one way of meditating is by emptying the mind. So this inner screen is showing a lot of things, but don't watch it come down over here. Just focus on the breath. The other way is filling the mind. Filling the mind with a more positive reality. So if, for example, when, when we do mantra chanting, the purpose is that on the, the, at the mental level, the thoughts are going here, there, everywhere we focus on the mantra. A mantra can act like a spiritual affirmation. So the mantra which I chanted, its mood is that, that we are all parts and there is a whole bigger than us. So the mood of chanting this mantra is, O part, return to harmony with the whole. O part, return to harmony with the whole. When we chant this mantra, that reminds us of our spirituality that reminds us of the bigger whole of which we are a part. And as that reminder keeps coming repeatedly, so the mantra is like an elevator, we could say. And the more we let the mantra enter into our consciousness, it's like we are entering into the elevator. And as we enter into the elevator, our consciousness rises. So basically, the, the focus of our thoughts, when we, ins when we ch start chanting the mantra, the it's like we are cr creating a new stimulus on the inner screen. And once that new stimulus appears, if we have made the habit of meditating regularly, then that new stimulus will appear that much faster, that, that, med that spiritual stimulus. And then as we dwell our attention on it, as we dwell on it, then our consciousness will rise upwards. So it acts as an elevator and we enter into that elevator by the attention that we give to the object of meditation. Does that answer you? It's still too, ab still too no, abstract. Right. So my takeaway is that we're essentially, uh, tell me if this is yeah. kind of takeaway or practical. Hmm. Uh, so my takeaway is that we're essentially practicing to be able to build a habit where we can either, where we control what's on our inner screen. So basically, Building a habit to prevent our inner screen from just showing us whatever. Yes, right. Okay, that's pretty good. Thanks. <laughs> Not so much necessarily control what appears, but we could say some things may appear, but we fo that choose what we focus on that inner screen. Yeah, please. Thank you. My question is how to control our thoughts, basically, how to control overthinking. Okay, good question. How do we control overthinking? It's a, 
it's a, it's a peculiar feature of thoughts. Thoughts also embody energy. It's like physical energy. But suppose if you want to push a heavy object, say if you want to push a big bag or a trolley, the more energy we apply, the further that trolley will move. So if we could come to compare a graph of physical energy with respect to uh, quantity of energy and the result, the graph would go linear. But with respect to thoughts, it's not like that. The graph goes up, it attains a plateau. When we think about something, clarity comes. If we don't think, we'll be impulsive. But at a particular point, thinking leads to the maximum clarity that is going to come. And after that, if we keep thinking, the result of thinking is the graph actually goes down. If the same thought keeps replaying again and again and again and again, at that time, our energy gets drained. And we end up feeling more perplexed, more uh, distressed. So first thing is to analytically understand that, oh, that uh, overthinking is not productive. Because our, our default, thing, default uh, tendency is, if there is a problem, I have to solve it. And to solve about it, I have to, to solve it, I have to think about it. But it's not just the quantity of time that we give to a problem. It's actually the quality of the thoughts that are involved over there. So that's why, in principle, if we understand that more thinking will not lead to more better thinking, then we can choose to redirect. One important principle in thinking is that we cannot not think of something. If I tell you, please, for the next 30 seconds, don't think of a pink monkey. I mean, you can think of whatever you want, but don't think of a pink monkey. In your whole life, you may never have thought of a pink monkey. But now, oh, pink monkey, how will it look? Oh, will its skin be pink? Or is it going to wear a pink dress? <laughs> what is it? So many thoughts will pop in. So we can't not think of thing. But what we can do is, we can offer the mind an alternative object of thought. So, th so we could compare the mind to a child. Say a child is playing with a knife. But for the child, it doesn't understand how dangerous the knife is. If you try to take away that knife, the child will throw a tantrum. And in that process, hold on to the knife so closely that it may injure. But if you give the child some other thing to engage with, then we let go. So for us, we have to, by self-observation, find out what it is that we can direct our thoughts towards. One of the greatest unaddressed needs in today's world is that we all need a satisfying object of thought. In fact, the whole entertainment industry, which people are ready to spend millions for it, is all for getting some satisfying object of thought. Think of something which is somewhat pleasing, somewhat enjoyable. But often entertainment, in its own way, fills us with further craving and agitation. So well, we need not entertainment so much as we need enlightenment. Enlightenment doesn't refer to some mystical state of seeing some light or anything like that. It just means we understand who we are and what we are meant to do in life. So if we can consider that this is a circle of things that interest me, and this is a circle of spiritually related things. If you could find out where those two circles intersect, say, I like music and there's spiritual music, or I like some images and I have some spiritual images with me. I like wisdom quotes and then I read some spiritual texts, find some wisdom quotes and I keep them with me. So that way, if we find something which is at the intersection of what we like and what is spiritual, then we can direct our thoughts towards that faster. And then, when we start overthinking of something, we direct our thoughts towards that. And as we direct our thoughts, because we like it, and because it is spiritual, so our thoughts will go faster over there, then our consciousness will get elevated. And when it is elevated, then after that, when we are calmer, we can come back and think of the particular problem. Whether I should think about it or how, in what direction I should think about it, 
how to think constructively that is possible when first we redirect our thinking. So we have to create those resources for us, we have to create or discover those resources for us which can help us to redirect our thoughts. Yeah. Redirect every time, and we have to take some important decision. How we can take it? Like okay, if we have to redirect, but we have to take some important decision. Yeah, it will. I would say it depends on what kind of situation it is. Sometimes some situations require immediate action. Mm -hmm. But so in that case, we just go along with our gut feeling, do what we what we feel driven to do at that time, and later on we can introspect and learn whether this was the right course of action or wrong course of action. But not all situations are like that. So sometimes we may be we may be tending towards excessive worry, excessive depression, that sort of situations. The situation is there as it is, and we are here, and we have to deal with the situation. But there's no quick quick fix or no immediate thing to address the situation. So those are situations when redirection helps. If the situation itself calls for immediate action, then we do what we can at that time. Maybe later in, introspect and learn how to respond better. But overall, redirection is not just necessarily uh, a choice we make when our thoughts are troubling us. If we develop a habit of redirection, then that habit will stand us in good stead even when we have to take quick decisions. Because over a period of time, if we create the habit of say raising our consciousness upwards to the spiritual level then over a period of time, the default level of our consciousness will rise up. So we spend some time meditating, our consciousness goes up. Afterwards, it comes down again. If you meditate again, it goes up. Maybe again it comes down. But through all this, slowly our level of consciousness rises upwards. And by that, we'll find that when even troublesome situations come, we'll be able to respond in a more healthy way, more affirmative way, even if we are responding immediately at that time. Because that's what is required. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Uh, may I have one question? Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the uh, much informative uh, session. Uh, so the question is, uh, what is your suggestion on the uh, 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 to start with the meditation? Those who are not yet into, uh, you told some of those techniques, but okay. generally, a lot of these things, um, you know, the saying goes that they should be done uh, and learned in the presence of a guru. The teacher. So, what is your suggestion okay. uh, to start? Yeah. So, is it so how do we practically start a meditation technique? Do we need a, uh, to start in the presence of a guru? It depends on what technique we are practicing. If some practices are involving a radical redirection in our life or uh, some huge change we are making, then it is best to have a proper mentorship or a proper guidance. But in general, the first step doesn't have to be a huge step. The first step can be a small step. And a lot of our choices are shaped by our association. So if you could just spend a little more time with people who are more spiritually minded. So we are talking about spiritual friends and a spiritual guide. Having a spiritual guide may take a long time to decide. Because that's a big step in our life. But just having a more spiritual environment around us, by choosing spiritual association, that is a small step which is doable for us in our situation. And then some basic techniques of meditation, like chanting mantras, that is something which you can incorporate right now also. And then as we keep taking steps forwards, generally spiritual growth is evolutionary. That we take small, small steps forward, we experience some benefit and we want to do more after. The result of spiritual growth is revolutionary. Over a period of time, we will find a dramatic transformation within us. But we can take evolutionary incremental steps right now. So I would say the best thing which you could, which you could do right now is spend more time with the spiritual association. Find out in your environment who are spiritually minded people and try to associate with them. Uh, thank you. We just had uh, just wanted to mention we had a comment uh, which said thank you so much for conducting such sessions inside Inter, and we look forward for such events more in future. Very helpful in dealing with day-to-day -day problems in life. 
Thank you. Um, and there was, uh, the, uh, before that, I'd just like to mention that we had about 150 participants online on the bridge. And uh, one of them uh, had a question. Um, sometimes you observe others need to rise above to get out of the worries of the future and the bad things from the past. However, they do not want to listen. Is there any way to help them? Any literature that can help? OK. So if you we, if we, if we can see that others need some help in rising above their situations, not getting carried away in the past or the future, how can we help them? Yeah, generally, you know, one human being can help another human being only in three ways. That is, we can provide knowledge, we can provide facility, and we can provide an example or an inspiration, you could say. That means, knowledge means if, if they, we do this, this happens. If we do this, this happens. Facility means, okay, if you wanted to go in this direction, these are the things which you could do. And inspiration means that I'm also going in this direction, and you see and move forwards. So if we want somebody else to become spiritual, then the first thing would be that we, if we ourselves are spiritual, that acts as a, at a conscious or a subconscious example for them. If we increase our spirituality and if others perceive a positive difference in us through that, that will help them in a significant way to take those steps also. The second would be that, as, you, as the question mentioned about literature, generally uh, we all need, we all may at times in our life feel that maybe I should become a little more spiritual. But if the resources available at that time, that is when we will take it up. So nowadays with the internet available, even through we can forward on social media, we can forward some articles, we can forward some videos. So I have an online resource. I have a website called GeetaDaily.com where I write every day a 300 word meditation on the Bhagavad Gita, which is a practical reflection on one of its verses. So it's GeetaDaily.com. So you could subscribe for that, you could read that and you could maybe forward some articles from there. And that way we can provide the resource available for them. And at the time when they feel it right, they will take it up. Yes. Hi, uh, my question is, uh, how do you keep yourself motivated all the time? Um, some tasks in life are mundane. Um, yeah. Sometimes uh, the people have family and kids and they do things for them. So sometimes others are a motivation for you. But how, by yourself, how do you motivate yourself for, for mundane tasks? And uh, even for for something that you want, not just mundane, you really like it, you really want it, but uh, you just don't want to do it. You just don't take the first step. Uh, that itself okay. is a big burden. So how do you motivate yourself? Okay. okay. So how do I motivate myself? Say if people have their family, then they do things for the family. Yeah, I would say that I have a big family. The world is my family, in a sense. Uh, I'll answer this in two ways. First is that, in all our lives, there are some things which we like to do and some things which we don't like to do. Now, nobody will ever have a situation that they, will ha they can only do the things they like to do. But the things that we like to do, if we can get enough strength from those activities, then we can do the things that you even don't like to do. So, for me, even before I was introduced to spirituality, I like to read, I like to study, I like to write, I like to speak. These were broad directions which I already had. I had a lot of faith since my childhood in the power of education. When I was studying my engineering, at that time I joined a social welfare organization and I would take free tuition classes uh, for slum children near my college. At that time I felt that by the, I was teaching the maths, English, history, hoping that through education, bigger doors would open, better doors would open for them. But I noticed that most of them came from dysfunctional families. Their fathers were alcoholics, there's domestic violence. Then our organization, we decided to diversify into not just education, but also try to help people to give up alcohol. One of my friends took up a village, small village, and I, I would go to the slum, he would go to the village, and we both 
We did our part and many people gave up alcohol. In fact, that village became free from alcoholism. But then one day my friend came back and he was looking shattered. He told me that he would go once a week. In between, there were local elections, the municipality elections, the panchayat elections, and a politician, political candidate had come in order to bribe the voters, woo the voters. He had given, he had brought four truckloads of alcohol and given it free to everyone. And not only the fathers, but even their kids had drunk. So that time I started thinking, there is something within us which works against us. So education may open doors for us, but unless, but we also need help to walk through those doors. Otherwise, we will not even be able to use the opportunities we have. So that was the time when I discovered the Bhagavad Gita and I understood about the mind and how it works against us. So as I travel across the world and I speak on spirituality, I talk with people, and I see many people in immense distress because of the mind working against them. And I find that by sharing this knowledge, they are benefited. And seeing others being benefited is what inspires me. So it gives me a sense of that I'm able to contribute something worthwhile. The first time when I came to America, uh, I'd gone to university and there a boy met me after his class and he said that, after the class and he said, just before the talk he was contemplating suicide. He had been in a relationship with a girl and she had broken up and he had just, uh, he was depressed, he was devastated. But they said, now I have heard your talk and now I understand that it is not I who wanted to commit suicide, it was my, my mind which is proposing me, commit suicide, commit suicide. So I told him that the spiritual knowledge has become literally life-saving for you. So he's grown spiritually over the years. Whenever I go, I meet him. So there are hundreds of, not as dramatic, but there are hundreds of people whom I feel are benefited by the spiritual knowledge, empowering them to deal with their own minds and their own lives. So that contribution that I'm making, that's what motivates me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Let me have one more question. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for a wonderful talk. Uh, I was on the bridge, but then I felt like I really should come down and see the person. So thanks. Thank you for coming. Um, so I, I have a question regarding lots of um, personal gadgets these days. Mm. And you know, it appears that rather than helping us, they're actually distract, just distracting us more and more. Mm. Um, so what are your thoughts on those? Like, are we going in the wrong direction in terms of, um, you know, uh, okay. by having all these personal technology okay. around us. I understand. Sometimes our gadgets seem to be distracting us and they take take away more time than what they save. So are we going in the wrong direction? I wouldn't say it's necessarily a wrong direction. It's, a, it's just that we have to have a proper purpose for our life. It's not that technology distracts us. It's that if we don't have anything important to do, which we consider as important ourselves, and those who are committed to nothing will be distracted by everything. So for those who want to be distracted or those who are vulnerable to distraction, technology can often make be enormously distracting. So one social thinker said that today we are distracted from distraction by distraction. And <laughs> that is our situation. So what happens is that if we, technology has already developed and if you know that old story of Aladdin and the jinn, the jinn has come out of the lamp, the jinn is not going to go back in now. So technology is already out and we live in a techno-centered world, we cannot, uh, we cannot remove technology in any way. But what we could do is, if we, we can find for ourselves a truly meaningful purpose for our life. And that is what spiritual, spiritual not, spirituality offers us. So if we, get, if we understand spiritual knowledge, then we understand that we are parts of a whole. We are meant towards to, to evolve towards, evolve spiritually, towards deep inner fulfillment, to deep lasting contributions, to great satisfaction. So if that becomes the driving purpose of our life, then distractions won't distract us so much. But unfortunately, 
the technological advancement it has been coupled with you could say spiritual negligence although there is some amount of resurgence of spirituality in some quarters of society but overall spirituality is relegated to the background and that combination is especially detrimental when we have no deeply inspiring purpose for our life we all may set up some purposes oh i want to get this car i want to get this promo raise i want to get this but these goals even after we achieve them they give us some fulfillment but again something else comes up and they don't really inspire us so much so if we have that spiritual purpose then technology can be used constructively and then technology can be a very powerful tool by if we can connect with many people and connect many people to life's higher values also so the techn- so technological advancement is a very powerful resource but needs to be coupled with spiritual advancement also at least with the facilities for spiritual advancement being provided for those who would like to choose it is that answer question been amazing to have you here i think intel, intel is honored to have sh- uh, heard the wisdom that you bring so well to our our, our hearts and our minds so thank you so much we'll i'm honored to see to you be again here.